Hey everyone, this is Hamza, co-founder of ZenML. I wanted to walk you through a few core concepts of ZenML for those of you starting their AI engineering journey. So the first thing to know about ZenML is that ZenML has a client-server architecture. So when you pip install ZenML, you can run both in your local machine, but normally what happens is that you deploy the server separately and then you connect to it with your client. And what's in the server is all um, the database uh, that stores the relevant information that we need in order to go through a uh, machine learning uh, operationalization journey. So assuming you're an ML engineer, an AI engineer, a data scientist, um, these words might be familiar to you. So we have pipelines, we have models, we have stacks, we have artifacts. And one thing that I wanna point out is there's a difference between the open source version of ZenML and the pro version, which builds on top of it. So I'm also gonna be talking about that. Let's start with maybe the core of ZenML and what is lies at the heart of every workflow that you write in ZenML is a pipeline. And particularly a pipeline is simply a series of steps uh, organized in any order that makes sense for your use case. So you might wanna have an, um, a RAG pipeline that uses something like Langchain or Llama index to index a vector store uh, or and create an agent or it could be a classical machine learning pipeline that actually trains a model and deploys it. And when you run a pipeline, so when you actually call that function, that is what we call a pipeline run. And a pipeline can be executed many times. In ZenML, a pipeline is essentially just a name that groups together a bunch of runs. So even within a pipeline, the structure of the pipeline can change and every run can have um, more steps or less steps, it doesn't need to have the same number of steps or the same code or the same configuration. So a pipeline is just a collection of pipeline runs uh, under the same umbrella. And you can keep running a pipeline again and again, and it has steps and artifacts. And we're gonna be talking about that in a second. One thing, the way a pipeline is visualized is in the dashboard is the um, DAG visualizer. So essentially a pipeline, another word for a pipeline run is a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Um, it just shows you all the things you need to do in one neat configuration inside the uh, dashboard. Now <clears throat> let's talk about how a pipeline runs and where it runs, which is the second big concept of ZenML. It's our stack concept. Um, a stack is essentially where you want to execute a pipeline run. So it's a collection, a stack in itself is a collection of stack components and each component represents a respective configuration of infrastructure or tools. So there are different types of stack components and when you put them all together like Lego piece, you get a stack. And when you run a pipeline, you have to run it on a stack. There's a default stack, of course, but there can be other stacks depending on your company and your work you're doing. <clears throat> so within a, uh, within a stack, I think the best way to understand a stack is through components. Um, and there are many types of stack components. You can see some of the abstractions we have. So ZenML itself is an MLOps framework, of course, that uh, abstracts away different types of things that you might want to do within machine learning. Um, but I like to learn about the orchestrator at the beginning. <clears throat> this is perhaps the most important component because it defines sort of where your pipeline runs. So an orchestrator, it could be an Airflow instance, it could be a Kubeflow instance, it could be something like an AWS Cloud Run or a SageMaker job or a GCP Vertex AI job, so on and so forth. So there's many different um, types of orchestrators we already have in the tool that ship with it but you can also add to these, right? So the way your, your image is, um, your code is dockerized, the way it's pushed uh, into the container registry, the way it's run, that's defined within the class of the orchestrator. So when you select an orchestrator, you know, I'm gonna run this on AWS, I'm gonna run this on GCP, I'm gonna run this on Azure. Um, <clears throat> and when the pipeline runs, it produces artifacts as we saw, and these artifacts are materialized or they're stored in the artifact store, which is essentially just a file system. It's a bucket, uh, an S3 bucket or a GCP bucket or Minio or something which has some sort of compatible uh, object storage uh, APIs. And again, you can extend this, you can have your own 
uh, file system that you bring. By default, we have the local file system. You can run it on S3, you can run it on GCP. Um, so this is where your artifacts are physically stored. There are many other components. I can't go through every one of them. I would encourage you to read the docs, um, container registries, data validators, experiment trackers, model deployers. They're all very important based on what you're doing. But that is the basic concept. So once you configure these um, and you put in the configuration, you can collect them all in a stack. And when you run a pipeline, you're running them on a particular configuration of tools and infrastructure, which is defined here. So we talked a bit about artifacts. Let's talk um, about them in a bit more detail. So in a pipeline, when you return something in a step, that becomes an artifact. Um, that's not the only way to create an artifact. You can also save an artifact directly in ZML. But in any case, uh, as I said before, these are your data uh, that flows through your pipelines and somehow are stamped and versioned by ZML. So artifacts themselves have versions. Um, they, are, they can be read through something which we call a materializer, uh, which is another class that is associated with the artifact, uh, how to read and write it. So let me give you an example. Let's say you return a pandas data frame. And when you return that, ZenML materializes it into the artifact store of your choice uh, with the pandas materializer. And then when you try to read it again in either in a subsequent step or maybe using the client library, it uses the pandas materializer to read it back into object uh, into memory. So that's um, that's what an artifact is. And you can use this logic to extend ZenML. And of course, you have a lot of uh, ability to version and track lineage of your data as it's consistently getting versioned. OK, now let's go on to models. Um, this is an overloaded word. And at ZenML, to be honest, we have thought a lot about how to name this concept. But um, in any case, the way we think about a model is not just an SK learn model uh, pickle file representation in artifact storage. Uh, so for us, a model is more of a business case. It's more of a project. It's more of some unit of value that is generated at work. So it could be the fraud detection model, or it could be um, something like a recommendation system. But whatever um, business value you have, you, you give it the name of a model in ZML. And a model essentially collects together artifacts from across different pipelines. So let's say, concretely speaking, you have, um, let's say you have a fraud detection model. You probably trained that fraud detection model. You probably evaluated that in another pipeline. Maybe you deployed it in another pipeline. Or maybe you have batch inference, which is scheduled and running every five days. And all of these pipelines produce many different artifacts, right? So if you wanted to actually have one look about your fraud detection um, use case, you couldn't do that with just your pipeline view. Um, however, uh, you can do that with the model view. So you can say to ZenML, when you run a pipeline, categorize all these pipelines and artifacts under the model fraud detection model. And then you have all the, uh, the pipelines grouped together. Models themselves have versions. So you, every time you, know, you can create a production version, you can create a staging version. So models themselves have versions, and a particular version is associated with multiple different pipelines and artifacts. So it's sort of like an entity that groups these things together. And in many ways, our model concept is like a model registry, but it also has an association with the model registry stack component, which you can read more about in the docs. Cool, moving on. So we have secrets. A secret is basically exactly as you would expect, like in GitHub Actions or GitLab, you have secrets. Um, it's basically just a dictionary of secret values that you can read uh, to and from. Um, so yeah, it's exactly what you expect. It's just hidden values that nobody, not everybody can access. Um, and within the secret, where the secret is stored is defined in the secret store. So by default, ZML ships with a, a simple secret storage, which is encrypted in the database, but you can bring AWS Secrets Manager, GCP Secrets Manager, even HashiCorp Vault or something like that. So you can plug that into your deployments and ZML will store all the secrets in that thing. Um, building on top of secrets is one of the more complicated concepts of ZML, I think, is the service connector. And we talked a bit about components. 
stack components and stacks. Well, oftentimes these components are, um, most of the configuration of these components are uh, secrets in themselves, right? So imagine you have a password or imagine you have an AWS SageMaker orchestrator, which needs to communicate with SageMaker through a certain, <clears throat> um, excuse me, service account. <clears throat> so you need to be able to put the configuration of your AWS credentials inside um, that stack component so that ZenML can either launch jobs if it needs to, or it can read the logs or do many things. If, ZenML, if, if the ZenML server needs to talk to your AWS account, or if the client who connects to the ZenML server needs to talk to the ZenML, um, to your AWS account. So to manage all these credentials, uh, ZenML has this service connector concept. This is not yet as of January 2025 inside the dashboard. You have to do that with the CLI when you configure stack components. Um, but essentially what it is, is really just a way to give your credentials in a safe manner. And uh, what happens under the hood is that these credentials are swapped out for short-lived tokens in your cloud provider of your choice so that we can safely communicate and authenticate with these stack components. So I'm not going to go into much more detail in this basic video. There's a lot of docs on it, but just think about service connectors as a way that you connect your stack components safely and securely to ZenML. All right. Um, for those of you who are just open source users, I think that should be enough. So for those of you who want to uh, learn more about the Pro, this uh, part of the video is for you. So ZenML Pro or ZenML Cloud, so if our SaaS version, we, sometimes we call it ZenML Cloud, um, is just building on top of an open source server. So you have you have a naming change. So a server so, uh, sort of becomes a tenant. That's what we call it. And you can see that essentially a tenant has, is encapsulated. So you can see tenant one has sort of the same concepts. Um, it has a few plugins as well. So it extends the open source server, but then it also has an encapsulation of another API around it, which we call the um, ZenML Pro API. And you can have, of course, multiple tenants. So you can have not just one server, but you can have a staging server, a production server. You can have for every team in your organization, a different tenant. So it's also a way to split up organizationally, and it's a way to um, manage uh, the infrastructure in a separate way. So you don't want a single point of failure. If you're running your machine learning pipelines, you might want to split that risk into multiple different um, tenants. And then of course the whole organization and uh, teams and, uh, and roles uh, which are exclusive to ZenML Pro are in this um, API as well uh, of the control plane. Let's talk about that one by one. So the first big concept is of course the concept of an organization. Um, this, let's say that's the grand uh, concept of ZenML Pro. Everything is happening within an organization. Within the organization, you can have one or more tenants. And a tenant is, as I said, um, just an open source server, um, and it's isolated deployments of the ZenML uh, server. Um, again, I would add that it's not exactly the ZenML server. There are a few more things we deploy alongside to get more features. But in any case, to make it simple, I think you can imagine it just as a server of ZenML running. Um, yeah, so of course you have organizations, you have tenants, but you need users and users can further be grouped into teams. So users are basically single accounts. You can use single sign-on and you can use, um, in some cases, username and password to sign up. Um, and you can see, in your organization who is part of the organization, and then you can um, group them together into teams to manage them efficiently. So for bigger enterprises who have that sort of business uh, logic inside, it makes it easier for them to group users together just like in GitHub. Uh, so you can assign teams to tenants uh, rather than having to individually add users. So that's pretty basic. The way all of this authorization is managed is through our role-based access control system, which is quite fine-grained. So you can really give permissions to the uh, individual tenants, to a stack, to a model, to a pipeline. Everything is sort of managed by a role. And we have standard roles. So we have organization level roles and tenant level roles. 
and you know there's a whole complexity around that um, but anyway there's a lot of flexibility along with that complexity so you can really fine tune and control as you might want in a in an enterprise um, see who sees what so like secrets and stack components are important examples in the open source version everybody can see everything um, yeah there is no centrally managed all this access control and finally um, there are templates so a run template uh, this is a pro only feature as well uh, a run template is actually one of the most coolest uh, things in xenomel pro i think because it's basically a frozen run in a moment in time that you can rerun from your dashboard or api and this allows many complex cicd flows it allows you to trigger a pipeline from another um, and stuff like that so it's very 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 interesting um, you can see this um, uh, GIF on the left, you can see how I, I'm launching actually a pipeline into, I believe, Azure um, without having to do anything on my client. And you can see how easy it is to convert any pipeline run into a template. So imagine that you have a fraud detection template, for example, again, and you just want to freeze that and you want to expose that to other members of your organization so that if they want to build their own fraud detection model, they can just run that pipeline. Uh, that's something that you can do with this uh, templates. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope that rundown um, was enough to give you an, an information about XenML and XenML Pro. And I hope you learn a lot. So if you're starting out in your journey, I would also encourage you to join our Slack. So if you just go to xenml.io slash Slack, you will get redirected um, or join our GitHub discussions or anything, any way you want to reach out to us. Um, we would love to hear your input. Um, this is, of course, subject to change. We are developing the open source framework um, even in 2025, also for GenAI workflows. So we might have a few more stack components. We might have a few different ways of organizing these things. But essentially, if you know these basic concepts, you're good to go as NML. So I hope this helped, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.